So Lee's actually a, uh, a local, but he travels all over. Uh, he, his moniker is the Agile Dad. He, he's a father figure. When you, got, when you got four kids eating under at home, it kind of automatically qualifies you as the Agile Dad. Uh, true story, I'll tell you something on on my laptop here. I guess I can preface this. Uh, one of the things that I learned at home is that there are a couple of different conditional ways that people learn, right? One of which is the same way that we teach children. Now, I know this is going completely against, uh, it's right here, I'll give you a I know it goes completely against what I can said at the Orlando Scrum Gathering, but uh, what I'm saying is that if we teach individuals the same way that we teach adults all the time, that there are going to be some times when we're lacking the ability to teach the way we teach our children. And where I'm going with that is that you're going to laugh. I am the total, oh, that's, that's terrible. Hold on a second for me. But where I was going is that my kids, we actually have a backlog at home where we keep all my children's chores and stuff. So uh, my wife and I got together and we said, we need to find a better way to do this. So we took my children and we said, okay, we have an idea. We wanted to incentivize the kids to get their work done. So we took and we created an agile backlog for them and we put the allowance amount in the estimate column. So then my kids can come home every day and they all fight to go upstairs after school and they check the backlog real quick and they say, oh, what can I work on? And they find something to work on and then on Friday we get together and we get all the kids together and we just, you know, pay them their allowance and do our thing and they get really excited over it. Then my wife makes a backlog for me for the weekend. <laughs> we discuss what I'm gonna do. I try to cut back on my velocity, but she has none of that. We go and I do the work throughout the weekend. On Sunday, we have a meaningful retrospective and we re-enter our kids' chores. So that's a little background about me, a little too much that you didn't need to know. But let me just get started real quickly. In case you couldn't tell, I'm pretty passionate about what I do. My name's Lee Henson. Uh, I do work as a full-time employee for version one in a capacity of an ambassador, certified, agile, guru, evangelist, whatever the case may be. Uh, but I also own an organization called Agile Dad. And the whole purpose here is to promote just better thinking, better interactions. So I could have named this slide deck Deja Vu, because I think many of you will see some things that you see as a reoccurring theme. And it's kind of coincidental because it wasn't you know, by choice. But hopefully I can get this eight hour training session, which has been converted into a 90 minute package that I deliver at conferences, which has been converted into a 30 minute presentation to you in 26 minutes. So let's see how it goes. The obligatory ducks, any questions? Okay, good, I got them in there. All right, so let's talk about the Agile Manifesto for a second. Everyone here, so far that stood on this stage, has focused on the same one line. I'm not gonna deviate. The focus of today's discussion is gonna be on individuals and interactions. And I think when I was first approached about this, I was really excited, because Dr. Coburn and I talked, Alistair and I, we're, you know, we, we talked about this on a plane on the way back from Orlando a little bit, and it's, it's interesting that when you go back to the roots of what's going on in the Agile community, a lot of the fallout or a lot of the pitfalls comes from individuals and interactions not interacting the way they should. So, from there I say, the question is, what if? Okay, now where am I going with this? My daughter asked me, you know, she's eight, can I go to the park, Dad? And I said, you know, I said, it's getting close to dinner, I prefer if you didn't. She says, well, what if I bring a friend? I said, well, you know, that doesn't change the fact that dinner's coming up. You know, we can't do that. She says, well, what if I ride my bike instead of walk? I said, honey, you know, dinner's coming up. And she got all mad. She says, you don't understand me. And she stormed off and went upstairs and slammed the door crying. Now, I thought to myself, that child needs to learn to listen, right? But what did I eventually discover? It wasn't the child who needed to learn to listen. It was me because she was trying to tell me something completely different than what I was willing to hear. So I went upstairs and approached her and said, you know, what's going on, and dug in, and she told me that her friend, who has a separated parent relationship, uh, was going to stay with her dad for six months, and she only had 20 minutes left that she could play with her friend, and she wasn't gonna see her for six additional months. Now, had I known that was the criteria, I likely would have made a different decision, right? But I didn't because I didn't have all the details. So agile teams are no different. They're very inquisitive. They want to know why, you know? They want to know, it, it, it's okay to say this is the best practice, or this is what we need to do, or this is how we're gonna get there. But the question inevitably, inevitably comes up is why? Uh, what if we do this? We need to say what we're gonna do and do what we say in order to be successful in an agile organization, okay? So it's the individuals and the way they interact. Now this nice young man, this is a real picture of him. His name is General Dave Mize. 
I had the pleasure, pleasure of working directly under this gentleman on a Department of Interior project. Now, I don't know if any of you have ever done this before, but this was very early on. We're talking early 2000s here. And uh, let's just say Scrum and Agile wasn't very popular then, especially on a government project. Well, I walked in, and the first thing I said was, you know, General Mize, I love you to pieces, but I'm not nearly as organized as you are. Is there any way you can help me out? I just want to keep a running list of everything I got to do. And in no uncertain words, I'll take out all the expletives, he said something like, boy, that's what you got to do to be organized. You go and do that thing and just get over it. Get out of my office. I was like, okay, good. So just one more thing. I realize your time is valuable, right? So I don't want to bother you with all these meetings, meetings, meetings. So what we're going to do is as an organization, we're going to meet daily, you know, 15 minutes, same time, same place. But for you, I just want to check in with you every couple of weeks. Take 30 minutes of your time so you can say, are we on track or are we off track? That's all I want. He says, that's the last question you're going to ask me get out of my office. And that was the end of it. But what had I done? In less than 15 minutes, and probably the same amount of time I had to say it up here, I established iterative development. I established I'm going to keep a running list of everything we're going to do. I established I was going to do some type of daily meeting to communicate. And that I was going to enhance communications, cut back on the amount of time he had to spend in meetings. Kind of the holy grail, right? The problem is, all too often we go through and we try to look for the silver bullet solution. As I, John mentioned in the last talk, he said that a lot of teams try to use a tool or a method or a specific prescribed way of doing things as a crutch, right? And what happens, I hear it all the time. People come to me and they say, you know, we know how to spell Agile. We read the first 12 pages of Ken's book and we're ready to do Scrum and we know everything there is to know about it. What tool can we buy to help us make this successful? You know, we're struggling, so what tool do we need to help push us through? And here, as a representative from one of the tool companies, I'm here to tell you, the tool's not the answer. Okay? There's no red, blue, blue, blue pill, you know, red pill, blue pill, whatever you want to call it. If there was such a thing, we would have all taken it by now, and we'd all be extremely successful. So if you're holding back, let me know. The point is, we need to figure out a way to make this man happy. Is that possible? Okay, I, my challenge to you is today we're going to find out. What happened, and I'm going to create a theoretical situation here, is that his project just went online, or started to go online. It was, well, oh, six months overdue and way over budget, and he wasn't very happy. So he wanted to know whose fault it was, right? That's a common question. Whose fault is it? So I'm here today to let the finger pointing begin, and we as a group are going to interactively figure out whose fault is it that his project failed. Anybody have any guesses right up front? Anyone? His. His? It's my fault. It's your fault. <laughs> Before the session, he told me everything was your fault, so that's okay, my friend. Appreciate it. All right. So we need to figure out, was it the executive? Was it other management? Was it the team? So let's go through and try to figure this out in a collaborative, agile way. So the first place to look is the levels of agile planning. Now, why do I go there? Because it's simple. If you've ever been to an elementary school, any of you, yes, the way they do it is they organize their playground. Usually, the kids get together by age groups. So all your kindergartners play in their separate area. The first graders normally interact with the second graders or whatnot, right? But they segregate the fields. And the reason they do that, anybody know? Yeah? Because if they're playing football, eighth graders will run over second graders. That's a good analogy. But it's simple. They need the separation so that they can have distinct areas that they're good at playing in, right? Now, the second graders might not need as much room as the eighth graders, but this gives them all the ability to play well together. Does that sound familiar? As an agile organization, one of our goals is to help everyone play well together, OK? So we've created these different independent layers, right? I call them little circles. I don't have the neat little drawy thing, sorry. So I got to use the little laser guy. Uh, but we have like you know the strategy layer, which is where our executive management lies, and it kind of trickles in from there through releases, iterations, continuous communication, etc. Right. So my question to you is: at the very outcome, does the executive lack vision? Now I've been in organizations and I've been within companies, and the big thing that I hear, the big message, an ongoing message that I hear is I hear people, executive level, tell their teams, we need to improve our product, we need to increase customer satisfaction by 20%, we need to do all these wonderful things, and I know I hired the right group of people to do it. You guys can do it. Sail well! 
How valuable is that advice? How valuable is it to sail well? What's missing? Anybody? How? Guidance. Guidance. Where? Example. Example. Concreteness. Something. Concreteness. But isn't sail well good enough? I'm an executive for crying out loud. I am the C blank blank, right? Sail well should be enough, shouldn't it? Or should it? Okay, so the question is, at what level does your executive and your organization interact with the team? Do they have their finger all the way down in the day-to-day -day activities and they're stirring a pot? Or are they the kind of executive that wants to sit back and give this helpful advice, even though they may not realize that the advice they're giving, eh, lacks a little bit of inspiration, okay? So, here's my definition of sail well, right? Sail well means we gotta manage the direction. We gotta chart the course. We gotta have a strategy to execute on how to get there, right? But the big one is the next one. We need to recognize that the executive, if they don't know this, is not necessarily at fault. Now, why do I say that? If the executive doesn't know it, whose responsibility is it to share it with them? Whose? It's the people in the inner circle who know, right? It's their responsibility to come back and say it's going to be impossible for us to execute on the advice to sell well if we don't have a strategy on how to get there, okay? So normally what happens, and this is something that's very interesting. When I go in and coach organizations, this is probably one of the largest pitfalls I see. The executive wants to be involved way down here. Why? Why? Go ahead. Okay, they want to ensure the success of the work. They want to ensure the success of the work. All the people in the middle aren't communicating. So what happens is this executive way up here says, I need to put my finger down here or else I don't know what's going on because I don't have, I don't have visibility. If I don't know what's going on, I need to be involved in your day-to-day -day stuff. So it doesn't matter how graphic or how direct my vision is. My advice to sail well should be enough because I'm going to be there every day to make sure you sail well. No, no, don't tie that knot that way. Let me tie it for you. You know, that's the executive we're trying to get away from. Okay. So the key is we have to understand what the direction is, what the course is, but we need to leverage other people to help us figure that out. But the big piece that you have to take away from this slide is that the executive is not at fault. So let's pretend it's Clue, right? It's not Professor Plum with the lead pipe in the kitchen. We've already eliminated him. So let's try our next example. And uh, the advice, first of all, that I'm going to give you from that, for empowering the Agile team, there's only a few steps. The first one is we need to learn to sail well, OK? The executive shouldn't have to give us too much more than that. And if we need more than that, we need to leverage the resources we have to get the information to learn how to sail well. So we need to learn to sail well understand the strategy and the driving force behind the vision so that we can continue to be successful as a team. So that's the first key, okay? There's only a few, so hang in there. So if it's not the executive, everybody knows right now, it's always the product owner, why? Because they write crappy requirements. Come on, guys, <laughs> okay? The product owner cannot, you know, this PRD thing, where did that ever come from? You know, they want to come to me with a 96-page explanation. I like to use an analogy. It's a simple example, okay? A lady goes in to get her hair styled. She decides she wants something completely different. If she walked into her hairdresser with a 96-page PRD, what's the likelihood she's going to get the hairstyle she wants? Pretty slim, okay? What if she walked in with a 3x5 index card with marks a lot written on there with exactly what she wants? Well, probably not likely either. Yet, every man in the room can attest. When we walk into a barber shop, we can tell the barber in 30 seconds or less exactly what we want and do we walk out happy? Yes. Moral of the story is women make poor product owners. No, just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't want to get shot up here. Moral of the story is that we need to get used to forming the barber shop explanation of what we want and stop focusing on the literature explanation of what we want. We need to start focusing on how to get to where we need to be to be successful. Now, the product owner would come back in and say, 
I wrote an extensive PRD, and on page 896, section 21A, uh, subparagraph 4, it states that blah, 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 right? Isn't that good enough? And my answer is no. Okay, that's not good enough. Because if you can't clearly define it, now I'm not going to use the, the silly template that everyone knows, as a blank, I would like to blank, so that blank. No, it doesn't need to go to that extreme, okay? But it should be simple enough that you should be able to give me, as a developer, as an architect, as someone on a team, a team member, you should be able to give me the barbershop explanation, and I should be able to say, I get it. It doesn't mean I have all the details, but it means I get it. The same is true for a project manager. There are two different kinds of project managers, okay? The first project manager, and it's my favorite one, is the one who says, I am here to remove all of the impediments. Oh, wait a second, sir. You're ergonomically incorrect, Mark. What I need you to do is lift up the back of the keyboard just slightly. Let me help you. And they run and grab the assist, and they run out and put it underneath. Oh, wait a second, sir. You're leaning too far forward. You're in danger of falling off your chair. Please sit up a little more. That person is better off dead. <laughs> okay? Because the fact is, everyone on the team wants to kill them anyway. Okay? But they're not really giving constructive, productive advice to help the team press forward. Okay? Then there's a second kind of project manager, who I call the dead project manager. That's the one that says, oh, gee, I have no idea. What should we do? What do you think? Help me understand here, I'm new at this. They're dead in the opposite sense, okay? So you may have heard Ken Schwaber's quote, a dead scrum master is a useless scrum master. That can mean dead in either sense of the word, okay? You can either be vibrantly dead, or wishing you were dead, or you could be so uh, that you're dead anyway, okay? So with that, the project manager should be trained to assist the team in breaking down a product requirements document if necessary, uh, they're responsible for removing the impediments. So if someone comes to you, like we discussed earlier, and says, these requirements stink, what's the first question you should ask them? Well, why is it important? But there's one that I would ask first. I would say, yeah, they stink, huh? What did you do to help? Did you go and offer a lend, did you offer to lend a hand? Did you offer to add clarification? Did you offer to give any valuable input at all? So my rule inside of the workplace is I am super flexible as a coach, right? I'm very flexible. But if you come to me with a problem, you darn sure well better have an answer or a proposed solution. Or else I don't want to hear your problem. Because I've got enough cheese to last me for many bottles of wine. So I don't want to hear any whining. No such thing as whining and agile. Okay, that was my virtual high five. <laughs> Good deal. All right, so if it's not them, then it must be the team lead, right? Because we all know these development managers and team leads, you know, people who are in charge of development organizations. One of my favorite stories, I walked into an organization and a dev manager says, I'm in charge of all of the HR issues that have to do with the department. I buy their software, I make sure they have the right hardware. You know, that's my job. Well, what else do you do? Why well, make sure that they're staying on track? So I went back. And I said, okay, let's have a meeting. Got the scrum master in the room. This was his team doing scrum. What's your job? My job is to help remove impediments and make sure the project focuses along. Grab the product owner. What's your job? My job is to focus on requirements, make sure the requirements break down is sufficient for the team. Went over to a VP and said, if any of these guys asked you for hardware that they absolutely needed, would you refuse it? Well, absolutely not. Okay, buddy, here's your box. The dev manager looked at me like, what are you doing? There comes a time in every Agile organization, and I'm not everyone's favorite person for saying this, but there comes a time in an Agile organization where certain individuals need to redefine their roles. What do I mean by that? Well, there's a development manager, there's other people who are used to doing the, their roles a specific way. It's not that they're not important or integral to the process, and it's not that they don't have contributions that they can make that are of great value. It's just that if they don't adjust their roles when a team transitions from a waterfall environment to an agile environment, they're going to get left behind. And as a result of getting left behind, they have trouble letting go of a few things they have control over. So a lot of times they're used to saying, you're the best at what you do. You are my best SQL Server writer. You know, I need you to write the SQL Server scripts for this because you're the best. 
when in actuality, these two guys just went to a SQL class, they're graduating from college, they're my interns, and I need to give them a chance to really prove their pudding. So I'm going to have them write the code, right? Or I'm going to ask them if they want to write the code. I'm not going to assign it to them, but I'll give them an opportunity so I can cross-pollinate between my team. Now, that creates a direct conflict between the development manager who's used to saying, you will do it, and the team who says, I'd like to have a chance of doing that. So we need to understand that that dichotomy does exist, and the way to get through it is to help the team understand the whys behind the whats. Okay? So if we ask a team to do something and we don't tell them why, they're never going to want to do it. But if you focus on a team and make sure you structure and tell them why, then they'll want, they'll have that desire to do it, and they'll understand the whys behind the whats. Okay? So, my favorite line on this slide, I gotta read it to you. The question is, did the senior administrative assistant to the vice co-chair, administrative director over employee satisfaction, see to it that the team's needs or satisfaction was met? My point being, in every organization I walk into, there's somebody with one of these ridiculous roles. <laughs> okay, sometimes it's not as far out as that one. But somebody has some role where they're sitting behind a desk and their sole purpose in life is what? They're not even sure was the answer up front. And that's absolutely right. So I challenge each one of you to identify these individuals and to help them understand where they can best fit into the agile picture. So one of my number one pitfalls that I was telling someone earlier today is that people don't necessarily understand their roles on an agile team. So we as an organization need to make sure that everyone understands their roles so that they can be productive. If they don't understand what they're doing, we can't expect them to be productive. All right. So here's number two. There are two different ways to manage. You can manage from the inside out, being that guy who helps you sit up and remove the chairs and really ingrained in the development day-to-day -day stuff. Or you could be the person who stands on the outside at the 10,000 foot view and manages by helping the team remove the obstacles that they can't remove themselves. I'm gonna say that one more time. Helping the team remove the obstacles that they cannot remove themselves. Part of empowering a team is allowing them to remove their own obstacles, okay? If they have trouble removing their own obstacles, it's our duty or obligation to help them in any way we can, okay? So we need to instill that confidence, but we need to give them a chance. If you're not giving them a chance, then you're one of those dead project managers slash scrum masters, okay? So, learn to sell well, manage from the outside in. Here are the seven traits of a highly effective manager. Yes, I ripped these off online. The reference is in the notes section. So while I'm on the topic, any of you who want the entire slide deck, including all the notes in PDF fashion that you can have, no worries. It's going to be published on the site from Agile Roots, but you can get it today at agildad.blogspot.com, and that address is coming up at the end. So you can go and get it. It's available for download, completely free, and it's the whole deck, not the slim down version. Okay? So here are the seven traits of a highly effective manager. The one that interests me the most here, right, there's two. One is improvement oriented. I can't tell you how many times I've met a manager and they've said, I have high expectations for my team, they do a great job. I say, well, what can they do better? They say, well, they're doing a great job. My answer is, how many of you are familiar with forming, storming, norming, performing, anyone? Yes, lots of you, good, lots of hands. I wanted to see that. Sometimes, once a team forms, and they realize that they're a little bit different, they start to storm. Then, when they realize that they can work together towards a common goal, they start to norm. But here's what scares me to death. How many teams actually make it from norming to performing? The statistics show less than 20% do. What happens generally? Well, two things. Either the team norms out so much that they get to a point where they're completely stagnant, Right? So they're completely normed out, and uh, you know, okay, I'm normed out, and uh, we have no further progress that we can make. And you ask them, so I need help. You know, David, I know I'm picking on you, but I need your opinion. I have this thing that I'm working on, and I just need to bounce an idea off of you. What do you think? And your response to me is, well, I'm going to go back and talk to the team, and we'll be back to you in 24 hours with an answer. That's a sign that you've gone too far in your norming. Okay? The person or manager who's working with this team needs to understand that in an effort to improve, 
you need to take advantage of those opportunities and introduce a little storm. Now, I'm not talking about introducing Hurricane Katrina here. I grew up in Louisiana. It was bad news. I'm talking about introducing a small storm that helps the team reevaluate or inspect and adapt. Okay? So it gives you an opportunity to see where you are and what's going on inside of your organization. So if it's not any of those folks, it must be the team, right? What do you think? Is the team the one that caused all this to happen? Is the team in the kitchen with a knife? Anybody? Yes? No? No opinion? I was about to say, I, this is the first time I've ever heard this group silent. <laughs> Come on, guys. Who do you think it is? Could it possibly be them? The question is, is it possible that they didn't have a clear understanding of what they were committing to? Or that they weren't aware of what they should have done? How many times do you hear, you know, not in your organization, but I'm just saying in general, how many times do you hear someone say, I opened that up and oh crap, it was a lot bigger than I thought it was? That's never happened to any of you, I'm sure, right? <laughs> or vice versa. You hear someone say, that bug's going to take me six weeks to fix. And they open it up and realize that someone commented one too many lines of code. Got a question in the back? Uh, I wouldn't put that as the fault of the team. If, uh, if, the, if they uh, didn't understand what they were committing to, I'm not sure that's the team's fault. So. Right. And that's why I put question marks at the end. I'm asking a question. I'm not insinuating that it is their fault. I'm asking a question. Mm -hmm. So, in your case, you're absolutely right. So we'll run with what you said. You're right. In this case, it's not the team's fault. But I would challenge them in a retrospective or in some other format and ask them, what could, it, what could they have done differently? Is there anything they could have done in retrospect to make their environment a little better? Now, it doesn't mean that I'm casting blame on them. Because we talked about earlier, and I can't you know, repeat it in an eloquent way that John did, but we need to make sure that we're not casting blame on someone Behavioral issues are important to understand with a team and with psychology background. We could talk about that for about eight hours. Okay, so the questions about is the team being effective? Here is a quick checklist, 10 items that you can run through just to know if your team is being effective or not. Okay, these are sort of geared towards Scrum because they came from one of my Scrum decks, but it gives you an idea of just some overarching questions that you can challenge yourself or ask your team. This is something you might want to print out and put in a team area so they can see it. So the last one that I have on here, or I should say second to last, is you need to enable the team to follow the 10 keys to effectiveness. Am I about five? Okay. So the last one that we have to realize is that the team inevitably has these aha moments, as Alistair calls them, right? There's this one moment when a team gets it, when it clicks, and you see the light bulb come on, and you go, ding, and that team just becomes hyperproductive. I'll do my Jeff Sutherland thing. They increase by 1,500% productivity, and they go through the roof, and they do 750 times the work that they could do. Okay? The team becomes a well-oiled machine. Okay? And we need to look for those things. When they realize that, you can see, feel, and smell the difference of the team. Any of you familiar with Agile smells? No? Mike Cohn wrote about it. So there are certain smells that are good, and other smells that are bad. Okay? These are the good smells. These are the smells of an empowered team. Are they collaborating? Are they doing team building together? Do they understand accountability? Are they being productive? Do they hold quality demos if they do demos? Are they having meaningful retrospectives? These are things that you can look at as signs of an empowered team. Likewise, on the flip side, there are foul team smells. Is the team losing rhythm? Are they finding the meetings that they're going to absolutely useless, especially the daily stand-up? I could argue that that meeting is completely useless if it's not done right. Okay? Are there missing pigs when pigs are needed? These are just signs that you can look for, you know, credit to my cone, but these are signs that you can look for to see if your team's falling into any pitfalls. So there's my pitfall Activision reference. Okay? Does the team suffer from lack of energy? Are they, they have no regard for commitment. You know, where are they? Do they not want to come to the demo? Do they find a daily stand-up meeting useless? If these things are happening, these are warnings that you need to go on a different track. Okay? So how do you fix these things? How do you adjust them? Well, you take them one at a time, and you keep the team smelling fresh. Okay? You can't tackle them all at once, but tackle each one individually. And from there, we just have to start today. You have to teach the team to realize that if you're going to give them power, 
if you're going to give them the ability to change things, if you're going to give them the ability to make decisions, that they have, they have to be accountable. And that great responsibility goes along with that. That they need to work together as a group, and play in their own playground, and that they have to make sure that they understand that they can rely on others within their team to help them be successful. So, start today. And that's all I got. So, you hold the keys to being successful. Visit Dwell and Drink often. I promised I published this for you. There it is. Okay? You can go there today on the right hand side. You can download the deck for free. I appreciate your time. And if I have one minute, I'll open the floor for questions. If not, I'm done. Okay. okay. I'll open the floor for questions. I have a question. Yes. So, you have this uh, analogy about a haircut in the barbershop. Yeah. Men's haircuts are pretty simple and yep. kind of uncomplicated. Mm -hmm. And if you have to deliver a feature that's a woman's haircut, then yep. it's a totally different conversation. Okay, so the question was, and this is, this is good, this is a valid point. He says that I use the analogy of barbershop versus salon, women's haircut being much more complex than a man's haircut. My challenge is, if we go with a lean principle here, and we say that we're going to break down the elements of a woman's haircut. Shave everyone's head. Well, that, that, that would make life way easier, shave everyone's head. But that's not where I'm going with this. Where I'm going is it's the same technique that you use on a woman's haircut that you do on a man's haircut. It's just a man's haircut is a shorter version of some of the same things that you would do on a woman's haircut. My point being, even though it may use a little different skill set to learn how to do it, the fact is when you break it down component-wise, layering is the same. You're using a lot of the same materials. There, there's just so many similarities that you can capture there, that it's just a matter of mastering something from a different perspective. That yes, it's same with uh, technical development. You're going to encounter things that are more difficult, but you need to tackle them each one by one until you can say you've successfully mastered them, and then one becomes much like the other. The goal is over time to make those complex things less complex. And I had a question in the back. Yes? Uh, you mentioned uh, kind of a good stand-up versus a bad stand -up. Can you elaborate? Yeah, stand -up? sure. Anybody who goes to a stand-up and hears, yesterday I worked on that item and I'm still not done, I'm gonna be working on that item today, no impediments, for three days in a row. That's an example of a really bad stand-up. There are others, but the point is, a lot of times people don't take the accountability because they feel like this meeting is worthless. I'm not getting the information I need out of it. So sometimes you'll hear me challenge and say, well, what if I threw out a fourth question and asked at what percentage of confidence do you have that you're gonna complete everything that you've committed to? Right? So if you go through one day and say, I'm 70% confident, 75% confident, 70% confident, then you come to a daily stand up and you say, um, I'm 30% confident, no impediments. What's the team going to do? They're going to react. So what you have to do is set up a way, a mechanism, for the team to interact better with you at the daily stand ups. And that's just one of many of the things that I teach. But it really depends on what the smell is. It's like going to the doctor and saying, I have a cough, I have the swine flu. <laughs> okay? You need to be able to discern what the problem is and analyze that and really figure out what that's a symptom of. So that's something through coaching that you can learn. But more times than not, people find these meetings ineffective because they're not getting valuable information out of them. So you have to find a way for them to get the information that they need and still keep the meeting as concise as you can. And then if the meeting's really genuinely not providing value, I would argue don't have it. Yeah. Uh, earlier you had your slide about the project being late and the general wants to know who's at fault. Yeah. Went through everybody and said nobody was at fault. It was kind of, but I have to tell you the general's not really going to be satisfied with that answer. He's not going to be satisfied with that answer because the point was that it was no one individual of those groups that were at fault. That in, this, in this scenario, there was a culmination. Satisfied with that answer? He still wasn't satisfied with that answer, but I, I, I told you a little fib up front. That project was actually successful. But had it not been successful, the answer that he would have been satisfied with is that it has to rest firmly on someone's shoulders. And in that case, since I was his direct report and I was the person who was his liaison, it would have had to fall squarely on my shoulders just because of the nature of the type of project it was. Now, had it been a different type of project, I could have gone to a group and said, here are the circumstances, here's what's happened, here's our deltas, here are new things that were introduced, here's a list of all the causes, and we're going to work on each of these to try to rectify them as we can to help get to a successful implementation. You know, in this case, it was a very immature implementation, and just trivia purposes here, this was the first government project to use Scrum, and it came in six months ahead of schedule on 1.3 million under budget. Okay, and he won an award for that. Yeah, he won an award for that. And when they asked him, so what did you do differently? He said, I researched and found out about this scrum methodology and I recommend that all government projects use agile methods. And he went on stage and did that. 
Now, I could have been bitter, but I wasn't, because I realized that this was a stepping stone for the whole Agile movement so that other people would have an opportunity to use Scrum and Agile in both city and county and state and federal governments. But to directly answer your question, somebody would have had to take responsibility because of the nature of the project. That would have been me. Yes, sir. Uh, one of the challenges I face quite often is uh, the, the problem of, you know, you have, uh, well, okay, we, we got a limited budget, right? Mm -hmm. And we have so many number of people on our team. Yep. And uh, we've got to get on the phone and talk to the client about this or that uh -huh. uh, feature. And how do you, how do you um, avoid the problem of spending your entire budget because everyone on the team needs to be in the meeting on the phone? You know what I'm saying? Like how, how do you manage communication so you can disseminate what everybody needs to know without everybody being in every meeting all the time? That's a great question. There's a class that's called Facilitation Foundation. If you go to the blog, I hate to do this to you, but I'm going to for sake of time. On the blog, you can download the entire slide deck. It's free. You can go through that. In Facilitation Foundation, we talk specifically about having the right people in the right meetings, how to save time, how to disseminate information, and how to get from point A to point Z. But last but not least, I just want to say thank you. You guys have been wonderful. You've interacted. I appreciate it. Enjoy the rest of the conference.